With this session update, I'm Shannon Lurkey. Senator Jeremy Miller held a press conference to highlight his proposal, creating a rare disease advisory council within the University of Minnesota. Here's that event. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. We are here today to talk about Senate File 973. This is a proposal to establish an advisory council on rare diseases here in the state of Minnesota. One in 10 Americans have a rare disease, resulting in 30 million people having a serious, lifelong condition, and more than half of those with a rare disease are children. The goal of creating this advisory council on rare diseases is to gather experts from across medical fields and have them come together and use their knowledge and expertise to provide advice, research, diagnosis, and treatments related to rare diseases. Minnesota being sort of the mecca of medical care and medical devices, it only makes sense for this rare disease council to happen here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, this is truly a grassroots effort driven by everyday people, including the Quimby family from Winona who lost their son Gavin a few years ago to a rare disease, and the Barnes family who lost their daughter Chloe. I would now like to turn it over to Erica Barnes, founder of the Minnesota Rare Action Network and mother of Chloe Barnes. Thank you. My name is Erica Barnes, and in addition to running the Rare um, Action Network, I also founded the Chloe Barnes Rare Disease um, Foundation in honor of Chloe in 2010. And um, Senator Miller already talked about the statistic of one in 10 Americans. But another statistic that is um, so crucial to understand is the diagnostic journey of rare diseases and how long that takes. So the journey usually begins for a family with a rare disease um, with no initial indication that a child or a person has any medical issues. My own daughter was born happy and healthy. Nothing was indicated at her birth that she had any problems. But after the symptoms appear, a rare patient waits on average seven to eight years to receive a diagnosis. Um, that can be much longer. One rare mother I know waited for six years for her son to be diagnosed. He passed away at seven. The vast majority of her life with her son was spent frantically looking for an answer to what was wrong with her child. Adding to the stress, rare patients are misdiagnosed multiple times. The average is two to three times that a rare disease patient is misdiagnosed. I don't have to tell you the economic and psychological resource drain that is on these families. Um, when a rare patient is finally diagnosed, the short-lived relief is often replaced with the nightmare of hearing from a medical profession, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. Because only 5% of rare diseases have any sort of treatment. That's not even a cure. So 95% of rare patients have no access to any sort of treatment. I know I've painted a grim picture, but the exciting news is that the future for rare diseases is bright. In the last several years, strides in diagnostics and genetic research has opened the door to possible treatments that would have been considered science fiction just a generation ago. I'll leave it to some of the researchers who are going to talk to expound on that a little bit. But I want to say that the state of Minnesota has been a pioneer for rare disease care for years, but we run the risk of falling behind if we don't prioritize the needs of the rare disease community. And all the scientific advancement in the world is meaningless if individual patients cannot access it. One of the biggest barriers to rare patient care is being able to bring the rare disease communities together. Only 15% of rare patient populations have a disease-specific organization. That means 85% of rare patients have nobody to direct them to specialists who could treat them, to possible clinical trials that they could enroll in and help them navigate the often confusing set of available resources and agencies. And by the way, medical advances are often predicated on a functioning and unified patient population. It's very difficult to make medical advances if you don't have a patient population that's already working together. Too often it falls on a rare patient to be his or her own and disease expert, research funder, policy advocate, and health system navigator. Imagine cancer patients not having any of the many cancer foundations in existence or not having treatment centers that have expertise in cancer-specific care. 
In my own eight-year advocacy work, my family has felt this frustration. I remember my husband once asking me in exasperation, Erica, why are you trying to do it all? To which I responded, because it all has to get done. Patients have to have somewhere to go for research. Research has to get funded. Policy has to make sense for rare patients and their unique circumstances. The Rare Disease Advisory Council can provide the infrastructure that is so desperately lacking in the rare community. And that's why I'm asking the Minnesota State Legislature to pass the bill for the creation of the Chloe Barnes Rare Disease Advisory Council. Thank you. Nice job, Erica. And, uh, Erica is truly a good example of the grassroots effort. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Erica's efforts. So thank you for all of your efforts and the time that you've committed to this. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Mahuthia. 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 <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Muthiala Ramaya. I'm a president of Indian Organization for Rare Diseases. Um, there are more than 50,000 people from India are in Minnesota. I'm not here to talk about the, just India, but give you an international perspective of rare diseases as we speak. Rare diseases are not localized. They are everywhere. They don't see the borders. They don't see religion. They don't see sex. Every, everybody is vulnerable. Therefore, it is important to have a unified theme to represent not only at the state level, even at the national levels. As we speak, on day after tomorrow, we are meeting at United Nations to take this as a, a world issue rather than just a, 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 a village or a town, a patient issue. So, a, a, and I'm so thankful for the, the state of Minnesota for creating this uh, advisory board uh, for the senators, for all the people that we represent in this country. In, in this state. So uh, my point is that this is an international issue, not just you and me. So we are all together. One voice becomes lot louder when we combine all these things. Thank you. And next, we're going to hear from Abby Hauser. Uh, my name is Abby Hauser, and I am a young adult and rare disease patient. The creation of this Rare Disease Advisory Council means a lot for patients, but it also means a lot for parents of young patients because the creation of the council will create more opportunities for rare disease to be understood throughout many different industries, and that will help children be able to grow into young adults that can then advocate for themselves like I can now. And as a rare disease patient, although we all have different diagnoses, we all face very similar issues within insurance or health care. And because of this, one council that covers all rare disease as a general topic will help so many more patients and it will make us not as rare as we seem. And with this council, we have the opportunity to have insurance and policymakers have an understanding of what it means to have a rare disease and how we interact differently with insurance companies and healthcare systems than your typical patient. And as we gain this understanding, it'll help create a stronger future. As medical leaders in Minnesota, we have the chance to join many other states in the creation of this council that will then help rare disease patients in Minnesota locally, like myself, but it will also help patients throughout other states to get their disease councils established. And as a patient, I really feel that I'm blessed to be able to be an advocate for myself because many young patients don't get that opportunity. So I find it's important to share my voice, but it's, there's also many of us that spend um, with the diagnosis that I have, which is classical Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, there is, um, I think the average time to diagnosis is 25 years. I was lucky and was diagnosed at seven, um, but many people spend their entire lives searching for a diagnosis. Um, and with the creation of this council, we can limit that and we can increase access to specialist care, which will then help reduce symptoms that go unnoticed. I've had many symptoms that progressed to the point where they didn't have to if there was proper medical knowledge of the condition and how it affects the entire body. So there's multi-systems working together with rare diseases. And as from the patient perspective, it's huge to have a council where someone is giving us a voice within legislation and within policy and insurance 
and research because that's where everything will happen in this council is really the way that we can go to create a really a strong future as medical leaders in Minnesota and for rare disease patients like myself in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. And if you need some inspiration ever, follow Abby on social media. She is an inspiration to all of us. So congratulations and thank you for being here. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Paul Orchard. Thanks, Senator Miller. <clears throat> so I'm Paul Orchard. I'm, I'm a pediatrician and a bone marrow transplant specialist at the University of Minnesota. So I appreciate everybody being here. It's, it's great to get uh, groups together that understand the importance of uh, rare diseases and what they mean to the state of Minnesota. I think it's going to be important to get this bill passed. I, I think there's a number of reasons that this is going to be uh, very important for us. In the first place, I think the state probably does not well understand the uniqueness of these patient populations and what they mean to the state. Where are these patients? How are they diagnosed? Where are they getting their care? Um, what kind of medicines are they using? Are they using any therapy at all? Uh, I think there's a lot that we really don't understand, and that, uh, establishing a council may prove a forum to help us get there. I think it'll be important as well for some of the families. As uh, Erica and Abby mentioned, a lot of families take a long time to get diagnosed, uh, to have uh, a forum where they can go to help make their, uh, their needs met or at least understood and help get that back to the legislature. Maybe there's things that we can do to help uh, make uh, therapy better able to, for, uh, to be accessed by, by the population of patients out there. I also think it's going to be important in terms of education. So uh, educating the families, they're, they're left on their own to help determine uh, what they should be doing, where they should be going, what kind of medicines might be out there for them. Uh, and I think we can do better in, in providing a framework for them to, to access education. I also think it's important to educate the providers out there. Some of these rare diseases, uh, primary care people have maybe never even seen. They heard about a medical school, for instance, but have not really taken care of. So helping them understand what diseases are and, and how they can be diagnosed and who's out there to serve as a resource for them can be exceptionally important too. So finally, I think from a research standpoint, this is also going to open a lot of doors. So <clears throat> I do clinical and some basic research. Um, I saw a patient earlier this morning who was on a gene therapy trial that's uh, relatively unique. There's only a few centers in the world that are offering that kind of therapy. I think uh, some of those opportunities are the way of the future, and we can develop those here at Minnesota. There's been interest in developing uh, Cell and Gene Therapy Institute here. And I think uh, there's a push. Hopefully, that's going to be uh, successful. We have a lot of resources here, basic science, clinical science. And I think we can do a better job taking care of the patients. The Mayo Clinic is also exceptional in terms of diagnostics. Uh, they uh, have newborn screening that was developed there that's internationally renowned. Uh, the Children's Hospital here also has people that are that are very interested in rare disorders. Um, I saw a, a proposal by one of the uh, new physicians, a cancer um, care person, who uh, wants to develop diagnostics for uh, genetic predispositions for cancer, help understand those diseases better, and help treat them better, too. So I think there's an opportunity to help integrate a lot of what's going on in Minnesota. We're a unique position as healthcare leaders in the field. And I think we can uh, make that or bring that to fruition even better by uh, helping put together a council so we can work together on these things. So again, thanks to everyone for being here. And uh, I hope everyone will uh, help support the bill. Thanks very much. Anyone who, who knows me, especially the staff, they know I'm not a big fan of uh, doing press conferences, but uh, this one was extremely important to me, and I thought that we had to get it done, and we did have some other legislators who were invited but couldn't make it this morning. The great thing about this proposal is it's a bipartisan proposal. This is not about Democrats or Republicans. This is about working together uh, to do what's right for the families uh, that are standing behind me and for, uh, to do what's right for the people in the state of Minnesota. We have the experts. 
We have the advocates, and I can't think of a better place to do this than right here in the state of Minnesota to make this happen. So thank you all for being here, and we appreciate it very much. Senator, yes, sir. Quick question. Is there any uh, fiscal impact on this, or how does that work? Uh, yes, so there is a fiscal impact, uh, roughly about $150,000 uh, per year. We would partner with uh, the University of Minnesota to have the advisory council uh, housed and uh, managed by the University of Minnesota, so roughly $150,000 thousand dollars per year would be the cost to this. And Eric, I've got a question for you too. Um, step up to the microphone. Um, you've said you've come across countless families, many of them here now, uh, mm -hmm. that have experienced somewhat what you have experienced. Uh, how has that touched you in terms of realizing how big of a problem this is? Um, it's really touched me in the sense that it's, it's made me realize if these same problems are being rec replicated in family after family after family, it just feels needless to me. And it, it really drove me to say, I, it, there's no need for the journey that I had and the difficulties and the barriers that I faced to keep happening over and over. So um, it, it was, it, it made me very um, motivated to try to um, establish this council because I just, I see it as something that doesn't need to be happening. Um, and I understand so deeply the the pain and the frustration. I mean, you're already dealing with a, a very sick child. The last thing you need is all these barriers to care that could be solved if we all just work together. And it sounds like one of the main barriers is just a lack of awareness. And, and that's what this council would do is raise awareness? Yes, exactly. Just a lack of awareness and, and a lack of, of even the patient community understanding that they're not alone. And even if their diagnosis is, you know, one in five in the state, there's other families, countless other families with very similar um, experiences. And um, so being able to just being aware, um, just the other day on our Facebook page, actually two moms with two very different diagnoses set up a play date together <laughs> with their children. And they're, oh, I have this rare disease. Oh, I have this one. Let's get together and let's go on a play date. And that was probably one of my proudest moments in all the work I'm doing to see two patients that thought they were the only ones in the state set up a play date because their children had such similarities. Can I ask Dr. Orchard a question? So could you explain to a layperson what maybe happens in a doctor's office where they come in and are presented with symptoms that they're not familiar with? Um, what do they do? What resources might they have just to, to try to figure out what's going on? Yeah, it, it can be very difficult for providers. Uh, you know, one of the situations is, is this a, a relatively common disease that's presenting in an uncommon way, or is this a very uncommon situation. And I think that's one of the things that initially you have to uh, sort out is that, now this is, this, is, this is a different picture than I'm used to taking care of. And I, I need to figure out where to go from here. And some of that might be their own research, but some of it might be, <clears throat> I need to find a geneticist that needs to see this kid or an orthopod or an ophthalmologist or whatever, and better define what the problem is so we can, we can move on. Uh, because as people have discussed, I mean, sometimes these, these families present with a, a piece of the puzzle and trying to put it all together uh, can be very difficult and can take a, an extended period of time. So sometimes it's just a matter of getting uh, in front of the right person who has got some sense of that, you know, this, we need, really need to, to dig deeper into this and, and figure this out to help make the diagnosis. And again, you know, there's some opportunities I think that are that are in development, like the newborn screening piece I touched on a little earlier. Uh, there are some some diseases that we can pick up now uh, at a blood spot at birth, and so it gives us tremendous opportunities to intervene earlier and to help change the course of of therapy for the patients. Yes, well, again, thank you everyone for being here. We appreciate very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Anyone else want to say anything? No? No. Okay. Thank you very much.